Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of Heartland Alliance. Good evening, everyone. It is so great to see all of us together in person this year, especially in these times to celebrate and support the incredible heroes in this room and around the world. I am Evelyn Diaz, and I am very proud to serve as president of Heartland Alliance. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our third annual Power of Healing event, celebrating the transformational healing that's made possible through Heartland Alliance International and the Marjorie Kovler Center. Sure. Heartland is a global human rights organization that advances social, economic, and racial justice on behalf of those denied it. Each year, Heartland Alliance International provides life-changing services to thousands of people in seven countries, in Latin America and the Caribbean, the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, and in Chicago at the Marjorie Kovler Center. While our programs address a broad range of human rights issues, including torture, human trafficking, forced displacement, and sexual violence, we come to the work with a unifying belief that everyone has a right to feel safe, to live free from violence, and to heal from trauma. And And we're distinctive in our approach to delivering trauma-informed care and psychosocial services that promote healing so that our participants are empowered to live a life of opportunity and fulfillment. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing from several guests, each of whom has a deeply personal experience around the challenges that refugees and survivors of torture face. We have all seen the heart-wrenching and terrifying images of violence, inhumanity, and displacement in Syria, Ukraine, and Afghanistan, to name just a few. Tragically, the number of people who need our services continues to grow. Our Marjorie Kovler Center now has a nine-month waiting list. We know our work is vital to promoting a more just and safer world. And we know we provide a unique and effective model of treatment and support. And we are so glad that you are here to learn more about it and support the work of Heartland Alliance International and the Marjorie Kovler Center. So before we begin with the program, I would like to take a minute to thank our event sponsors. We are very grateful to our premier sponsor, the Judy and Peter Bloom Kovler Foundation. <laughs> to our presenting sponsor, a very generous anonymous family foundation. And to our platinum sponsors, Mary Fabry and David Goldberg, thank you for your continued support. And to all our other sponsors supporting us here today, thank you all. I would also like to recognize our event co-chairs, the Judy and Peter Bloom Kovler Foundation, Mary Fabry and Gold David Goldberg, and Daniel Kirshner. as well as the Kovler Leadership Council and our dedicated staff and volunteers for making tonight possible. Thank you. I'll end by just saying I am incredibly grateful that all of you have joined us tonight, whether you're here in person or online. I have no doubt that tonight's program will be a beautiful reminder of what is truly possible when we come together to take action and create a just world for all of humanity. Thank you.
yo pudiera describir las palabras como círculo de mujeres, yo lo defino como fe. Es ver y creer en aquello que no, no, tiene, no es tangible. Pasto es una zona caliente, por decirlo así. Y no todo el mundo ve con buenos ojos el liderazgo. Hay personas que aprueban el mismo y hay otras personas que de una u otra manera, pues, no lo ven de esa manera y uno corre el riesgo, hasta físico. El hecho de ser líder sí hace que uno en, en algún momento sienta temor. No hay que negar esa realidad. Yo empecé a trabajar en temas para prevención de violencia de género aproximadamente año y medio. Antes de conocer a Jaya, dentro de las eh, limitaciones, era el conocimiento. No sabíamos cómo llegar a la población, no teníamos los medios para trabajar, no teníamos esas herramientas. La experiencia de formar parte de los círculos de mujeres para mí fue un regalo. Primero, como experiencia de vida. 15 días antes mi mamá había muerto y yo estaba devastada emocionalmente. Dios me dio la oportunidad de pertenecer a ese círculo. Yo digo que en su infinita sabiduría el universo confabuló para que yo también fuera parte de un proceso para sanación interna. Mientras que yo no pudiera sanar, no podía colaborar con el resto de la población. Y estar allí me permitió primero adquirir herramientas, sanar internamente y fue otra gloria. Renací en ese proceso, me permitió la posibilidad de, de crecer internamente. Aproximadamente entre todas, era un grupo de 10 mujeres y fuimos varias lideresas terminando con 30 mujeres, uniéndonos entre nosotras. Aún continuamos con ese proceso y a la par de este proceso o de, de estos círculos también la ayudamos como emprendedoras. Permitió que este círculo diera otras actividades como otros oficios, o sea, no fue un espacio nada más para hablar y calmarnos, sino ver las posibilidades de emprendimiento, ver las posibilidades de la parte laboral, nos creó tejer entre nosotros, tejer espacios, experiencias y crear una red entre nosotras mismas, que de hecho hoy día la llamamos red de mujeres. Me veo empoderada, aprendí con el círculo de las mujeres empoderarme aún más, me veo con mi negocio, andando, no dejando a un lado el liderazgo. Hoy día, de una u otra manera, soy ejemplo, no por vanagloriarme, sino que veo que las personas siguen. Y el hecho de que tú seas pilar para que otras personas entiendan que sí se puede lograr salir adelante a pesar de que haya violencia de género, porque en algún momento también lo viví. De hecho, en el Círculo de Mujeres entendí cómo manejar esos procesos. Siento que el futuro es favorable que no existe un no, sino más sí. Good evening and hello to everyone gathered in Chicago for the power of healing. It's an honor to once again be a part of this evening in support of the life-changing impact that Heartland Alliance International and the Marjorie Kovler Center have had on so many lives. As we celebrate the Kovler Center's 35th anniversary, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge Mario Gonzalez, a founding member of the Kovler Center and its current senior director. Mario, your dedication and commitment are an inspiration to us all. When I had the pleasure of attending this annual event three years ago, I was deeply moved by the stories from survivors whose courage, enduring hope and resilience are central to the power of healing. Through the Marjorie Kovler Center, survivors of torture summon their inner strength and with the support of the Kobler community, begin to heal from past traumas and start rebuilding their lives. That work is made possible by so many people, but tonight it's my pleasure to honor my friend, Dr. Alita Black, a distinguished Kobler Leadership Council member, scholar, and lifelong advocate for human rights, women's rights, and this year's recipient of the Kirshner Award
for global activism. In memory of Dr. Robert Kirshner, this award reflects the incredible support and dedication of those who are committed to making a difference in the lives of torture survivors. And I cannot think of a more deserving awardee than my dear friend, Alita. Alita has dedicated her career to lifting up the voices of women and girls around the globe, documenting women's political history, and effectively equipping leaders and members of the public with the lessons of the past to overcome the challenges of the present. Her dedication to create a more just world, in addition to her integrity and compassion, are among the many reasons I have long relied on her as a close advisor, colleague, and friend. Alita embodies the spirit that another of my friends, Peter Kovler, hoped for when he founded the center 35 years ago. She's a strong believer there can be no healing without justice and no justice without healing. So it is my distinct honor and great pleasure to present the 2022 Robert H. Kirshner Award for Global Activism to Dr. Alita Black. Hey, Alita. <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Peter Kovler. I'm the son of the center's Marjorie Kovler, and I am having the once-in-a-lifetime really awkward experience of trying to add something to what Hillary Clinton has said, <laughs> and even more awkward to what Hillary Clinton has said about her close friend and colleague, Alita Black. So maybe you'll let me give it a try to make two or three very quick points. First, there is something that cannot, cannot be learned about Alita using a search engine. Alita is the quintessential happy warrior. No help for any human being is beyond her. But if you are going to join her in any of her fights for justice, you'd better have a sense of proportion about what you can reasonably be thought to accomplish, you better have a sense of humor about your own limits, and you better have a sense that fighting for right and justice does not require a grim demeanor. On the most serious of subjects, such as what we deal with here, she can somehow combine her sense of what is moral with her sense that life must include collegiality and friendship and a shared sense of mission and a sense of humor or irony. In short, she is a joy. Second observation, effort at an observation. Not for her are conventional ideas about how and when to help someone. If someone or some group needs help, regardless of other people's ideas of life's boundaries. She is there and ready to get to work. It is why she has a life that has included such a broad range of humanitarian work, helping people with disabilities, that may be for a few years, people with AIDS, LGBTQ groups, African Americans, females everywhere in the world, new immigrants, on and on and on. In short, if you are struggling, she recognizes struggle. It's a little conceptual, but she somehow identifies what another human being has, is in a battle. Alita sees boundaries that are, when she sees boundaries, she does not see it as a stop sign but boundaries are an opportunity to break apart some old and very bad ideas and an opportunity where she can come and get the job done. It is why she has been able to practically invent the 21st century 
scholarship on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in my <laughs> and in my opinion, uh, to be among the leading scholars to give the gift of the memory of Eleanor Roosevelt to new generations. Ali and I go back many, many years to a time when Eleanor Roosevelt was not widely remembered. But Alita and a couple of others have made sure that a new generation knows just what this woman did, this woman known, for example, in my, to my family as the first lady of the world. So I could go on and on, but I have promised to be short. I will keep that promise. Ladies and gentlemen, the remarkable and inspiring Alita Black. <laughs> Enjoy. Take a picture. We can, we, can, yeah. we, can, yeah, we can be public people. Yeah, we can be public people. Here we go. Yay! <laughs> Take your turn. Well, in case you can't tell, I love Peter Kogler. Um, Thank you all so, so very, very much. Um, this is a really rare experience for me. I'm usually the one that's like kicking people's butts to get them up here. So um, when Mary called me and asked me if I would accept this, I immediately said, are you flipping kidding me? And started, you know, rattling off all these people and then um, my spouse, Judy, and Hillary sort of read me the riot act, and, um, and so I stand here. But I stand here um, with the fullest heart that you can possibly imagine. Because for me, life is about vision and passion and fear and joy and not letting things get in your way. And that's why I love the Marjorie Kobler Center. And um, I'm a historian, so you have to let me set the stage for just a second. Um, today's world is irrationally defined in the negative by hate, by fear, by anxiety, by intemperance, by intolerance in every sphere imaginable, politics, psychology, in physical nature. But we cannot let distrust destroy us. That is the lesson of history, and that is the lesson that I have learned from the people whose courage I sap to stand up here today. Because I'm here because, yes, I got this award, but I am here because of the glorious joy that my life has brought me to work with extraordinary people. For Hillary Rodham Clinton to be in the world is the greatest gift in the universe. And what Hillary taught me is that you don't care what people say about you. You don't care what the press says about you. You care on what has to be done and you risk every fiber of your being and your reputation to get it done. And when people tell you no, you keep going. With with my friend Maymont, 
who I love with all I am. You may be the bravest person I will ever know. And to be your friend and to see you embrace democracy, to see you embrace you and what you can be, to see how you care for other people with all of the hate that has come to you is a joy I cannot describe to be your friend. You know, and my friend Peter, we've argued politics and which organizations we should support and um, what's the best way to talk and, you know, when to use the F-bomb and not when to use the F-bomb. But um, only Peter Kovler could embarrass me with love the way that he did just now. And I look forward to being your family for another 25 years. Um, but I, you know, we're talking about Kovler, we're talking about the power of healing, and we're talking about courage. So there are three other people that I would like to metaphorically bring up here with me who um, have really risked all they've had to be my friend and my family because I am sort of crazy when I commit. Um, I haven't, I don't know how many times Judy and I have refinanced our house, but nobody on the planet could have a better partner than you, Judy. You never say no. You always say, how can we get it done? No matter what it costs. And I'm serious, I can't tell you how many times we've refinanced our house because I shot my mouth off. Um, and then there are um, a few other people, and if I run over, I'm sorry, but it's my moment, so I'm gonna claim it. Um, it is also my extraordinary honor to um, work with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, whom you must bring to Kovler. Ellen was the first democratically elected to lead, uh, woman to lead an African nation. She stopped the most violent civil conflict, conflict since the Second World War, and she won the Nobel Peace Prize. And now she is dedicating her life to lead women in Africa to stop war and lead nations. And to be um, in the shadow of Ellen, is um, I don't have the words for it. The only thing I know is that she and Hillary tell me in both ears simultaneously, Alita, you can win a war, but you have to win the peace, or winning the war means nothing. And like Judy, my friend April, who flew here from Atlanta, um, I've known April since she was 18. If I had a daughter or I had a sister, it would be April. But when we left Kovler today, April already had four specific policy ideas that we could do immediately to help the clients and elevate the center. So when you have April whispering in your ear, you don't have time to be lazy or to ask why not. And then lastly, the two people that um, you will learn from tonight, my great friends, Louise Penny and Melissa Fung. The power of the pen, the power of conscience, the power of risking yourself and showing your soul on a daily basis 
to people you will never meet, to make the world more whole is a gift that I cannot describe. The only thing that I can say is that we are all Kovler. And that is what Peter and others envisioned Kovler to be, a place to confront pain, to embrace triumph, to know that joy is eternal but also fleeting, and that you cannot do justice without establishing community. And so to be affiliated with the Marjorie Kovler Center for the Survivors of Torture um, is one of the honors of my life, and I am exceedingly grateful for this award, and I promise to cause good trouble for as long as I can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. I don't do this very well. <laughs> but now I get to ask them questions that I do very well. <laughs> um, first, it is my great joy to introduce you to um, my friends, Louise Penny and Melissa Fung, who I will introduce in Alita speak. Um, there are uh, many people who can write crime novels. There is no one in the flipping universe that can turn a crime novel into a plea for humanity and justice and compassion in a way that takes you into a community repeatedly, novel after novel after novel after novel. I can't do 18 in a row. <laughs> but, um, that you, that you cannot wait to read because she takes you into a community that always makes you struggle and always makes you uneasy, but always when you finish it, you grow. She has also won more Agatha Awards than anybody in the universe. <laughs> and she has the patience to text with me every other day. Okay. So um, my friend Melissa Fung is the new group to the, 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 the triumvirate that we have become. And um, I use that word with precision because the day that Kabul fell was the day we became an intractable triad. And Melissa is an extraordinary journalist and documentary film producer, both with the Canadian broadcasting system she has done an extraordinary memoir of her time in captivity called Under an Afghan Sky, her documentary film on the girls of Boko Haram, just won the highest award that you can win in Canada for a documentary film, and instead of accepting the award, she is here supporting the Kovler Center tonight. That's all you need to know about me. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just going to ask them questions and they're just going to rip. Okay. <laughs> so, I said that, um, that we became friends when we um, united over the women in Afghanistan. And you all brought your own stories to that. And so, what I thought we could do is to talk about the challenges that you have faced and how that helped you prepare for the work that you do. Yeah, and you, and you talked about, thank you for this, and I also want to say that we visited the Kovler Center today, and it was breathtaking and heartbreaking and inspirational and just the most extraordinary experience. And so thank you to, to everyone here who works at the Kovler and who supports the Kovler and give them money, lots of money, right? But I loved what you said too, but you know, we all met out of tragedy. 
-hmm. and, and my books are about, they start with the tragedy, but that's the Trojan horse in which all other issues like love and community and, um, and our yearning to belong, mm -hmm. it allows me to explore that. And that didn't, you know, all I can do is talk a little bit about my own experience. And the, 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 the theme today is a beautiful one, the power of healing. But in order to heal, you have to hurt. And I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the line that I actually use from one of the, um, one of the um, titles of my book, the, the Leonard Cohen, that ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything that's how the light gets in. And we're all hurt, and we're all cracked, and we're all shattered in one way or another. And my way isn't the same as Melissa's, which you'll hear in a moment, and not the same as yours or the people, uh, the clients at Kovler, but I um, am a recovering alcoholic. Um, and, and, you know, when you bottom, you know, you shatter. And, and out of that experience, I'm only here because that happened to me. I'm only here because I came within a breath of committing suicide. I'm only here because I know what despair is like, and I know what it's like to heal. I know what joy is because I know what hell is, and I know what hell is not. And so it's just, it's wonderful to be here today to talk about not the pain, but the healing. I just want to echo what Louise said about visiting the Kovler Center mm -hmm. today. I am just so humbled by the work that you all do. And, and please donate as much as you can because the need is so great. Louise is right. Um, to, in order to heal, you have to hurt. And sometimes, you know, that hurt uh, can come back to haunt you. And Alida mentioned that I recently made a film about the girls of Boko Haram. And when I um, finished filming, I came back to, I'm based in London now, I came back home and, and I had started having nightmares. And I have this one nightmare um, over the last 15 years that has me waking up in my bed and my, my pillows and my sheets are strewn all over um, because my dream starts off with I am walking on a very pastoral sort of a mountainside and I hear a girl calling for help, a voice, and it's a girl's voice and she's asking for help. And I look around and I can't see anything. And I keep walking and the voice gets louder and I realize it's coming from the ground. And so I start digging in my dream uh, with my hands, dig pawing at the ground, trying to get at this girl to help, to help save her. And then that's when I wake up because then I haven't been able to. And if you know my history of being kidnapped in Afghanistan, I was held in a hole in the ground for 28 days. And so that dream comes back to me once in a while and I don't know what triggers it. Um, but instead of now being scared of it or held hostage again by it. I look at that as a reminder of why I'm here and I'm only here and I was only able to tell those stories, the stories that I tell now um, because of what happened to me and that is a part of healing. It's what Peter said this afternoon, turning grief into action. So. So you both, in very different medium, have embraced this profound responsibility to help awaken the world in how strong community is and what happens to us when we lose it. And so, Louise, I, I wonder if you could talk a, a little bit about how in um, the madness of crowds, which 
It's not my favorite Louise, but you know, if I said it would be my favorite Louise, I would have to lie about the 16 others that are also my favorites. But this one was exceedingly important to me on many levels. A, it dealt with a torture survivor. B, it dealt with how rumor takes over a community as fact and what happens to a community when you lose that distance. And so I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about what you were trying to achieve with that in a, in a way, in addition to telling really an extraordinary story. And I'm not saying this because she's a sister level friend. The woman that is the center of this story is the most unique character you will ever read in fiction about a woman surviving torture. And I know how hard Louise struggled with this mm -hmm. because she would call me and we would, well, I put you her helped, you, helped, you helped a lot. But, but I mean, if you could talk about that, because it's an, ex because what she did in that book, and this woman, is always number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And she, you know, we read her, but Middle America and East Podunk read her, <laughs> as well as everybody in New York City. And so what she does is open a community up to globally, because her books are published in 30 languages. Well, so. you know, I, but I also felt, I really struggled with it. I mean, my experience isn't, as a torture survivor, and you, you and I talked about opening up wounds, and you talked about opening up, up wounds, very serious wounds, and having people with PTSD and, and, and forcing them to relive it. Um, and, and that idea of, um, of, of uh, you know, stealing some of the experiences uh, and adapting uh, some of the experiences as entertainment. And I, and I really struggled with that. And you and I talked a lot about that and how to frame Hamia is her name, uh, who is a torture survivor. And, and, and the temptation, to be honest, was to make her saintly. This wonderful woman who's actually won the, or up for the Nobel Peace Prize and, and she comes to this little village, she's invited there, um, and, and that she would be somehow, you know, larger than life, some superhuman. Um, and I felt it was really important to, to show her as, as flawed, as someone who, who has been hurt and brought to her knees and, and risen up, but not necessarily, and, and like, 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 like Humpty Dumpty, you know, the pieces have been put back together, but imperfectly. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think we sometimes expect that people who have been through terrible traumatic experiences and come out the other side will somehow have uh, you know, again, as I say, be saintly, and, and I didn't want to do that. Um, and, you know, all I can really do is, if, frankly, the more in touch I am with my own experiences, and that's part of, uh, you know, I joined a 12-step program, and that's part of, of recovery. And like, you don't do it alone. I don't know of anyone who, who gets back on their feet alone. You do it because of their community, and that's the power of the Kofler Center. You know, these people who come and knock on the door of the Kofler Center, need help. I got better because I asked for help and help was there. These people are getting better because they're asking for help and the Kofler Center is there and Heartland Alliance uh, is there. And that's really at the core of my books. The, the, there's a, a quote from Auden that, that I, 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 I don't actually use but that informs the books and it's, um, goodness existed, that was the new knowledge, his terror had to blow itself white out to let him see it. And that's informed my life, a life, I know what terror is, but because I know what terror is, I know what goodness is, and I know that it exists. And I am happy. I went from being in despair to being joyous because help was there. I'm still struggling, um, and I've, I, I'm, I'm okay to say that now. You know, when I first came back from captivity, 
I wanted to prove that I was okay, that I was resilient, that I was able to go back to Afghanistan and report on the election, and, and I was ready, and I didn't want PTSD to be um, a stain on me as a journalist, partly because I was a woman, and I knew that my male colleagues were kind of looking at me very closely um, to see you know, I, I felt pressure as a woman to not show the cracks mm -hmm. so much. Uh, but, uh, you know, as time, I think time, it's such a cliche, but it does heal and it does make you, um, it gives you a different perspective the more time passes. And, and like I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today if this hadn't happened to me, this right. horrible thing. You know, it's hard to go in as a journalist to a place like Nigeria and have young women tell you about the worst thing that happened to them. But because I can make that a conversation, a give and take, you know, yes, it happened to me too. I was kidnapped, I was raped, I was taken hostage. This was taken from me. My dignity was shattered. It was okay. And I think that's where the the, the, that's where there is a power of healing. And that's why, you know, what the Cobbler Center offers and the counseling that you give to people who seek help is so valuable because it is about a sharing of stories and somebody just listening. And, and if you have somebody who is willing to just listen to you uh, and your weaknesses and your fears, um, then, then that's when healing is possible. And so. Yeah. Um, I'm really grateful for what the Cobbler Center does for, and I, we know, right? We have all been dealing with Afghan women for the last year. Um, and that's how we, that's, that's how we met. Said, that's how, yeah, we, that's how, that's we, how we met. And had, you know, that's again, the, the irony, isn't it? That had that terrible ongoing tragedy not happened, we would not have met and become close friends and inspired each other. I mean, there, there really is light through the cracks. Um, but as you said, too, the ability to be, to be vulnerable. I mean, I was raised to never, never show fear, never, never show emotion, for that matter. But the more in touch we can be with our emotions, the more we can, as you said, admit that, you know what, We're, we still hurt. We still cry. We still feel lonely, the ache of loneliness and, and, and in uncertainty. I get on Facebook and I say, I'm really scared about so-and-so, and I'm inundated with people saying, oh, well, you shouldn't be scared and you should be aware, you know, 18 books out and whatnot. And I said, no, it's, that's the price you pay for being vulnerable, for being human. But what you two do is pretty rare. I mean, the triumvirate that we formed. I mean, I didn't know who she was. You know, I see this passionate voice coming through my text. I think, okay, we're gonna be friends for the rest of our lives, you know, and then we meet and we will be friends for the rest of our lives. But what Louise and Melissa do is they take their own personal courage and all that it took to get there and they turn it into unstinting efforts to keep people from hurting knowing that they can't make the pain go away but they can get them out of danger well i mean honestly what what you and melissa have done is extraordinary the lives that you have actually saved and as you said i mean how many times and you weren't joking how many times have you, have you remortgaged your house i mean uh, you know poor judy i think did, didn't you force her to sell a kidney yeah i did I, it was the third kidney she had to the sell. third kidney the third right kidney. exactly you know. yeah yeah and and you know honestly the the resources in every way that you put in to, to saving lives, the time, the, the money, the effort. It's, but again, that probably wouldn't have happened. Do you think it would have happened? Let me ask you this. Do you think it would have happened if you hadn't been in the hole? It's so weird for me to be asked the question because it's usually me on the other side. Um, <laughs> I love that. 
you know, I'd like to think so, hmm. right? Because I have always thought that storytelling and journalism was a force for doing good and to help each other, to help us understand each other better. But you know, as journalists, though, generally we're voyeurs. So we stand back and we watch and report. You actually act. It's really hard not to act when you see some of the things that we see, you know, whether it's Nigeria or Afghanistan. Um, it's hard to be a bystander and not try to do something when somebody is hurting. But don't you think most do? That, that that's part of like being a doctor. It's you have to, you almost have to be the witness rather than the, the person who's actively involved. And that's one of the things I, I so admire about you is that you were able to, to be a, an award-winning documentary producer and you've got a book coming out, but also to, to be personally involved, to see it as your vocation, your calling, and part of the healing. I think that's exactly what that is. It's part of the healing. It's part of the healing for me. It's, you know, turning what that horrible thing that happened to me into something good. Yeah, that's the beauty of this, isn't it? I mean, it really is. It, 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 it humanizes you. It teaches you um, an empathy that you may not have had or a degree of empathy because you don't want anyone else to suffer. It's like your characters are always, you know, not all, not all of them, but... You except know, the killers. You, except the killers, yeah. right? You, there's a lot of empathy <laughs> in, your, in, your, in your stories, yeah. right? And, and that is something that I think, you know, we could all use a little more of. I agree. Yeah. Well, one of the things, just to wrap this up, is that one of the reasons that I admire them so is that their word is their bond, and they are intractable when they commit. And that's what the Culver Center has given all the people who walk through its door, is a community that's grounded in integrity, in honesty, in ability, in, you know, in a candor about pain, a candor about what it takes, to come back and the soul armor that is necessary to do the work. And I think that what Louise and Melissa give the world is also what they give me, which is soul armor every day mm. to get up and say, we're going to beat those jackasses. It may take us a while, <laughs> but we're going to figure it out. You can see why we love her, I know. right? Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>live or die. My wife and my trick is still in Togo right now. When everything started, I have to move them out of the family house, far away from the city. I had one life before, back home, and the second life is here. So I can say that second life is story from Copeland Center. First of all, the, the language class, and then all the medical bills and stuff because I got, really, I got really sick. I didn't have insurance at that time. They sent me to like a hospitality class and then I'll be working at a hotel for like four, four years now. So everybody you meet in this building is ready to listen to you, is ready to help you, is ready to pay attention to what you're saying. Once they pick up the phone or open that door. I mean, you have uh, this is starting of the solution of the issue you bring, you know. 
I got the approval, so I'm about to apply for my family. So that's a great news for now. Seven years ago, I can say I was a little confused. I don't know how to get along the city. Now I'm feeling excellent. I can say that. Good evening. My name is Ron Stegall, and I'm speaking to you from the coast of Maine. It's a real pleasure to be with you in Chicago and online across the country. Because by your participation in this event tonight, you demonstrate your belief in the perspectives and the programs of Heartland Alliance. My role tonight is to introduce you to Ali Azim, who embodies Heartland's values and is this year's winner of the Sister Diana Ortiz Award for Courage. I get to tell you a bit about him and his remarkable family. Ali was six years old when I held his hand on the three block walk to his first day in school in America. That was in Washington, DC. And I can still feel his hand shaking a bit on that piece of his journey. That was in 1984 after the family had made a daring escape from the communist regime in Afghanistan. His father, Dastagir, had walked miles each day to an open air primary school in rural Afghanistan. Dastagir went on to the university in Kabul and he became a pilot for the Afghan National Airline. And much later, for United Airlines here in Chicago. When Ali was only five, he had led his younger brother Wally and his pregnant mother Nazanin, a broadly talented local employee of an American aid organization, out of Kabul at night, disguised under a traditional head covering through mountain passes and into a refugee camp in Pakistan. Dastagir reached the camp after escaping to India. Some might say that this family is living the American dream, but I believe it's more accurate to say that they, like many other immigrant families, our dream Americans. As the Afghan refugee crisis deepened, Ali offered his talents and resources to multiply the efforts of the Heartland community to meet the challenge. He and his own family, Kelly, Owen, and Avery sponsored several Afghan refugee families. He became a very effective spokesperson, fundraiser, and ambassador for Heartland, and he is committed to doing more. The sister Diana Ortiz Awards notes that she
that was humbling. <laughs> um, and it's a shame that that got cut off because Ron uh, spoke at our wedding. And um, he's just terrific. Um, uh, but before I get emotional, um, I just wanted to do a quick poll of the audience. Raise your hand if you had a five-year-old refugee from Afghanistan who gets to stand in front of 250 people to accept this award on your bingo card tonight. <laughs> I don't think anybody did. I am one of the lucky ones. Um, I am one of the fortunate ones. I'm so lucky to have an amazing wife, Kelly, who is my rock. I'm so lucky to have two awesome kids who just make me so proud of what they are and what they're going to become. I'm so lucky to have so many amazing professional colleagues and so many friends and many of them who are here tonight who have been an incredible sounding board for me through the years whether it's professional related whether it's personal related or some of you guys who sit down the left field line for me at a minor league baseball game talking about 10u strategy and what we would do different you are uh, just awesome friends and i cannot thank you enough and i'm also lucky to have two amazing parents <laughs> who can't be here tonight because of COVID, uh, but I know they're watching and listening. And when you combine those two amazing parents with two amazing brothers who have also been on the same journey and they're uh, just respective families who have also been the support network, I'm like, my parents and my family got a chance. And with that, my parents broke their back and they did everything in their power uh, to make sure that we had a chance to succeed. And maybe it's luck, but I'm sure there's some hard work and there's some sacrifice and there's tough times and there are emotional up and downs. Uh, but in order for us to experience those feelings, we needed a helping hand, an opportunity, uh, just access to basic human services. Somebody to mentor my father who it sounds funny at the age of 48, but he, he needed a mentor. He came to a new country. I can't imagine leaving here at my age of 44 going somewhere completely different. And he had a mentor. Or just a person to tell you that it's okay. And there's tough days and there's bad days, but there will always be good days. And some days it feels like you walk one step forward and you go three steps back, but somebody has your back. And, and so my family's version of the Heartland Alliance was Ron and Lael Stiegel, and unfortunately his wife passed away a couple of years ago, but they basically were uh, just our support network, uh, financial and emotional, and it was their family, and it was their broader community, and their unwavering commitment to human dignity, the spirit of selfless friendship, and personal sacrifice for the greater good is why we had a chance. And when you look at today's world, whether it's Afghanistan, the Ukraine, or areas closer to us, so many people displaced who all have to start new and all they want is just a chance. And so I challenge myself every day and I challenge each one of you guys every single day uh, to keep that spirit burning inside of you because who knows, somewhere out there, there's a five or six year old little boy or girl who's going to have to go and try to figure out if their suit still fits after three years of COVID and potentially come and write a speech <laughs> and accept such an amazing award. So thank you. the traditional clothes in Sudan, it called Tob, and this is connect me to my country. It was scary and it was very difficult. Probably this is a difficult decision in my life to leave your own like,
country and your family, everything, and move to the another country. And everything, it was like different. The culture, the food, the language, the weather. It was really hard and scary at the same time. The way I lived was like a genocide. Very much every day, like people killing, people die, burn. It was really hard life to us. My decision to came to United States because I was thinking of my future. And I was very sure if I stayed there, I would not have a future. I was in a situation I need help. So when I came to Cobbler Center, I met Marianne and I explained to her that I needed house. They helped me with food. They helped me even with mental health. They helped me with probably everything that I needed. I really have a strong memory with Maria. That was my first winter in Chicago. And you know, as an immigrant, I don't have like winter clothes. And it was really cold. And the first thing Mario did, he just walked away and he grabbed a big, warm, nice jacket. And he helped me to put it on. And uh, he asked me if I want a cup of tea. And it just reminded me of, you know, father things or dad things. And that memory is still in my mind. Like, I just can't forget it. If I have any problem, the only people that I think of is Cobbler Center. Even sometimes I feel homesick, I just walk into Cobbler Center. I feel much better. My goal is right now to go to school for caseworker. And I promised myself that I will be working for Hotline. So because I get a lot of help through this organization, and I feel like I want to reward them back by working with them. Uh, is this working? Uh, thank you. You just heard one testimony to a lifetime of work that uh, Mario has done for so many people, and I'm um, humbled, is the word of the evening, um, to be able to introduce Mario at a moment when he's going to retire. 35 years ago, in 1987, I reached out to Heartland Alliance. It was once called Travelers and Immigrants Aid. There's a whole history here of Jane Addams and many others in hopes of starting a program, was my reason for reaching out, which was specific to support survivors of torture. I heard about a program like this in Copenhagen, of all strange things, and was surprised to find that nothing, nothing at all like this existed in the United States. Heartland introduced me to a brilliant, brilliant young clinician. His name, Mario Gonzalez. He would become a co-founder of the Marjorie Kovler Center. I was immediately struck by Mario's deep empathy and understanding of the need. After all, he himself had fled Guatemala to protect his family after a long-running civil war had threatened teachers, professors, students, members of unions. He watched many of his friends and instructors simply disappear. And those who did return from incarceration, from imprisonment, they just came back as very different people. One of the first things Mario did here in Chicago 
was to teach civics classes for refugees. This led him to creating support groups for refugees, refugees in particular who had experienced torture. As he discovered, this was all too common an experience and that it was shared by so many. Through the creation of the Marjorie Kovler Center, Mario was able to expand these groups and over time help to develop new forms of therapy specifically designed for survivors of state-sponsored torture. Mario and his colleagues developed an approach that, in his words, let humility lead. They co-create the treatment approach with their participants, such as Maisa, I hope I've said it right, Maisa, who you've just heard from. Under Mario's leadership, listen to these numbers, because numbers sometimes tell a story and sometimes they just are a, are a blur. Some people are number sensitive, some uh, respond very much to numbers. Tens of thousands of asylum seekers and refugees from more than 90 countries from around the world have found support, community, and healing. It is more to understate it than I ever could have imagined when I first made calls about this subject 35 years ago. 37, depending how you count it. Mario, you have embodied through your service the belief that unites all of us in this room tonight, those who are here electronically, that there can be no healing without justice, no justice without healing. As you transition to a very well, well-deserved retirement and more time to spend with your family. I met, had a chance to meet Anna with one N tonight. And I understand children, or it was a Gabrielle grandchild who I just met. I think I speak on behalf of every single one of us when I say I am eternally grateful. Thank you for your leadership, your creativity, your vision, your expertise, your friendship, your service, and just being a damn good person. It is a true Lee, an honor to present to you tonight the inaugural Courageous Champion Award. Coming up. Oh my God, <laughs> I'm truly speechless, um, which is gonna be a good thing for you, it's gonna save you the pain for my boring speech that I prepared before. Uh, well, you know, this is really an incredible moment in my life. Um, since this is my last um, appearance, as Harlan Alliance and Kohler Center staff. It's kind of a mixture of feelings. I, I cannot describe um, emotions just pop up and it is hard. <laughs> so my apologies. Um, I want to express my gratitude in the first place for all these 35 years to my family, especially to Betty, Anna with an one N, <laughs> uh, sitting here. Uh, she has been my support, and you know, without her, I don't know where I would be these days. 
and to my family, the rest of my family that are sitting there, even my grandchildren that are joining us here. Um, well, it says, I think uh, love is the root of all the things that we do, and uh, I really love you guys. So thanks very much for this reciprocal feeling that keeps uh, being my motto. Then uh, I want to express my gratitude to, to my colleagues, uh, volunteers and staff from the past and present for always being willing to carry over the plan to serve uh, the ones in need. So thanks to everyone. So I see so many faces from the past and present, and thanks to all of you, my gratitude. And also I want to express my thanks to this organization that allowed me to do what was in my heart, that was helping people to heal from the most terrible and dehumanizing trauma that's torture. So it is paradoxical that some of the reasons that contribute to my forced migration to this country were the same reasons for being hired at the Kohler Center. And um, it is for me, it's, it, sometimes I think, and these reflections just bring me back to how things, you know, what was better described in the beautiful words that uh, our, you know, guests, uh, keynote speakers brought to us. You know, there is no dark without the light and no light without some dark. And so it's always like that, you know, so without those experiences that forced me out, I never would be able to be here doing what I did and uh, trying to help. So finally, you know, because I don't want to make this, like I said at the beginning, a very boring speech, um, I, I, I want to express my eternal gratitude to a group of people that are our participants. They were my mentors my teachers, and my inspiration to do this work. I really am grateful for all that experience that made me, I don't know, grow, being a better person. And just thanks to all of them for allowing me to help them, to help themselves. So and I think that's the most important lesson that I learned in this 35 something years. Um, well, I think, uh, you know, I just reached the end of my career and uh, I retired with a bittersweet flavor, like many times happens. Um, the bitterness comes from the not, uh, the knowledge of not being able to end the task that was ending torture, and also the sweet feelings that come from seeing a new generation of um, human rights defenders that are involved today in the Kobler Center when we were, so I was just uh, calculating the ages of all of my coworkers, and I saw a legion of very young people really devoted and compromised and committed, I mean, to this task of trying to make this a little bit better world. So with that, I'm gonna finish, and I want to introduce my colleague, uh, Esteban Moreno, who is the director of uh, our programs in Colombia. And he's gonna be talking about precisely about this future that this new generation is bringing. He's gonna be talking about the future of our organization. So Esteban, if you are around, please come back. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. 
It's such a pleasure to be here tonight. And I'm so grateful many of us are able to be together in person this year. And thank you for everyone who's joining us online. At this event, we have reaffirmed our shared commitment to protecting human rights. Tonight, we have, friend, we have heard from friends and colleagues about the devastating situations affecting people around the world, including in many places where Heartland Alliance works. Forced migrations, human rights violations, and outright war. And the impacts of these strategies. We know that there are so many more. So many lives transformed by conflict, discrimination, and lack of opportunities. Yet, in the face of these enormous challenges, what we see every day working with people affected is also a story of hope of resilience and resistance, of strong communities, of fearless activists, of committed organizations and their allies, coming together and fighting for a more peaceful, equitable, and safe future for all. As a Colombian who has seen decades of conflict, this is what inspires me, that through our work, we can reach those affected give them tools, and together find solutions for a safer today and a more peaceful future. Last week, in Cali, Colombia, I saw the incredible work carried out by one of our community agents. She survived conflict, and she's now a leader for fellow survivors to help them change, to help them heal. I was impressed by how she addressed the group of recently displaced women. She talked to them about mental health and explained to them how it was okay not to feel normal after dealing with an abnormal situation. They connected with her experience and her story, understanding that another future is possible. She will continue supporting these women through their journey. She will help them heal and recover as she herself has done. This work is possible thanks to you and our brave teams around the world, to those who believe in the power of coming together and changing lives, to those who believe in the power of healing. United, we can overcome these immense challenges with your ideas, your creativity, and your partnership. Thank you for joining us. Our friend Brad will, will now join us on stage and give you all the opportunity to continue supporting this work and this incredible mission. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kids of all ages, how is everybody doing tonight? Let's try that again. Are we inspired by the power of healing tonight? This side, this side needs to work on it. Uh, I tour around the country helping a lot of organizations, and this one I, I am so proud to have become part of the Heartland Alliance family in the last year. What they do is, is so unbelievably inspiring. And tonight especially, Alita, where are you? Where are you? Raise your hand. One more time for this wonderful, amazing, just, I was so excited to hear you tonight and, and thank you for just all you do. And tonight, we need all your help. She said it, uh, Louise said it, where's Louise? There you are, again, I, I'm in awe. And one more time for Louise, please, Melissa, everybody, everybody tonight. Louise said it, can't do it alone. We need all your help. All that you've heard tonight, we, we can make a difference in people's lives tonight, all of us together. So tonight, first I need you, if you haven't, uh, there's a manila envelope on your tables. It has your numbers. Everybody have your numbers? Yes? Yes? All right, let me see them. Raise them up. Raise them up. Raise them up. Raise them up. 115, a million dollars. 313, a million dollars. Alita, you get to keep the house. Uh, obviously, I'm being silly, but 
We have a lot of tiers tonight. We're going to start at $5,000. We're going to go all the way down to $100. And all of it adds up. All of it funds the perfect name for this evening, the power of healing. So tonight, if you have it, dig deep, give a lot. Sound good? All right. We passing those numbers around. If you get the number wrong, that's okay. Give somebody's money away. It all goes to the same. Don't do that. Don't do that. That was a joke. I will get in trouble for that. They're like, be funny, but don't be that funny. All right. Everybody have their numbers? Yes? Woo! Thank you, sir. More wine for him. The first tier tonight is $5,000. $5,000 pays for case management for 15 Kovler participants for a week. 15, look at her, look at Alita. 120, give it up for Alita, everybody! That's how we do it! Amazing. You just keep amazing. All right, so if you got 5,000, let me see it. Raise it nice and high, everybody. Give them some applause. Give them some encouragement, everybody. 134. 179, 135, 225, 343, is that you, sir? I can't tell. Were you fanning yourself? Not yet? All right, I'll hold off. Any other 5,000s in the room? I got a spotlight in my face. I don't want to miss anybody. We do? Yes? No? Where? 221. Thank you, sir. I like that you're subtle about it, but I have to see it. All right, any other 5,000s in the room? Give them a nice round of applause, everybody. The next tier is $2,500. It pays for group, group therapy, yes? Group therapy for a full month. You've heard all the stories tonight how this therapy can make a difference. You can fund therapy to change people's lives for a month with $2,500 tonight. So if you have it, raise it nice and high. Let me see it. $2,500 in the room? Do I have any 20? Give them some encouragement, people. 332. Any other 2,500s? 2,500. Oh, 270 with a big smile. I like it. Any other 2,500? 168! Thank you. 2,500? 2,500 going once. 2,500 going twice. One more time, give them a nice round of applause, everybody. Our next tier is $1,000. $1,000, yes. Charles, you're waving to me. Do you want to give? What? Can I come there? I'm entertaining right now. <laughs> really? You promise? All right. Apparently, Charles wants to talk to me for a second. Give it up for Charles, everybody. Do I keep your number? No, you keep your number. Oh, because you want to get, okay. All right. This doesn't usually happen. <laughs> this is why on live TV they cut to commercial. <laughs> so that I don't go, duh, duh, hi. This is amazing. Uh, their family foundation is teaming up with another family foundation. <sighs> wow. $30,000 match. Right here. Right here. Absolutely. Get on your feet, people. Make some noise. Woo!
This is how we do it. This right now is the power of healing. This right now is how we make a difference in people's lives. I literally have chills. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, all of you. And this lovely lady right here, not only did she give me a check, she wanted to give me her number because she said I also want it. Not her phone number. Easy. Uh, she Don't make it weird. Uh, she wanted to give me her number to give another $1,000 on top of that. Please give them a round of applause for these wonderful, wonderful people. Chuck, can I call you Chuck? No, <laughs> he said no. Keep the money, but don't call me Chuck, clown. $30,000. If we can raise 30 paddles for $1,000, they will match it right now. Put them in the air, people. Let me see. Give them some encouragement. Yes. 164. 161. 160. 162, 114, 119, 126, 254. Keep them up, keep them up. 250. I think I got 116, 114, or they just gave twice. 117, 177, 122. I have a feeling we're going to do it. Make some noise, people. 326. 195, 327, 209, 202, 206, 204, 292, 224, 216, 154, 155. Did we do it? We need five more? We need five more people, five more. 244, that's five. 203, that's four. 220, that's three. I need two more in the room. We got two more thousands in the room. Oh wait, I didn't count hers. So that's what, you know what? We just got three more. Hers at 110. 185, 123, that's $31,000! Woo! Nicely done. Thank you. This is how we do it. Look at Alita just smiling. <laughs> She's like, I get to keep the house. <laughs> you have a huge heart. Um, now, I do want to mention, I'm talking about the tears tonight, but understand that all your donations go to everything. They just really wanted you to understand the different programs. So like I said, 5000 makes a difference, but so does $500. You can now pay for 10 food kits in Colombia, feeding an entire family for a full month. $500 can feed a family for a full month, and that's why she's already got it in the air. Let me see it if you got it. $500 right now. 305, 314, 191, 194, 134. Thank you, young gentleman. 343, 213, 299, 222, 336. 177, 101, thank you, sir. Any other 500s in the room? 320, 156, any other 500s? 500 going once, 500 going twice. Give them a round of applause, everybody. Our next tier is $250. Pays for 20 hygiene kits along the one-stop shops on the migra migratory route from Venezuela to Colombia. They just wrote that for me. Uh, $250. You can make a difference. Let me see it. 316, 259, 182, 181, 315, 174. 170, 235, 231. I hope you're keeping up with me, Margaret. 324, 278, 
137, thank you, sir, 122, 125, 136, 132, 135, thank you for the assist, young man, 150, 214, 218, 296, 295, 280, 334, 344, thank you, 297, oh, and some more, 110 again, look at you, 115, 241, 245, you did get the 110, right? Any others in the room? All right, and I want to get a high five from these two right here. Can I get a high five from these two right here? Give it up for these two. You two, come on. Give them a high five. Oh, no, okay, one more. There it is. Give it up for these two right here. Proudly giving all night. I'm not saying you're my favorites, but you are. $100. $100 pays for community cooking at the Kovler Center. A, com a cooking experience at the Kovler Center right now. I love that they're already in the air. Give them a round of applause, everybody. $100 right now. 256 167 291 298 142 134 145 144 158 151 153, 290, 272, 335, 275, 273, 277, 263, 196, 197, 260, 265, 328, 317, 318, thank you for the woo, 301, 141, 112, 176, 247, 308, 306, 109. Oh, you guys get quiet quick. Going once, going twice. Give them a round of applause, everybody. We've got one more special thing for you. The wonderful people of Kovler are celebrating 35 years of the Kovler Center. Please, a nice round of applause in honor of them. All that you do is, as I've said tonight, inspiring. So in honor of you, $35. You giggle. But it all adds up. You heard everything I said tonight from group therapy to food. 35 plus 35 plus 35 is something. I didn't graduate high school. But it all adds up and you can make a difference. So you know what? If you got an extra $35 tonight, raise it nice and high. And let's make an extra difference tonight in honor of the Kovler Center. 167, 170, 174, 176. 122, 121, 128, 127, keep up, Margaret, 252, 184, 253, 303, 316, 320, 314, 262, 135, 313, 264, 261, 278, 277, 209, 205, 202, 203. I have to do it at a pace so they can write it down. 200, 334, 206, and 208. I don't know if you stole somebody's number, but we'll go for it. 204, 214, 142, 211. Thank you, sir. 145, 139, 156, 230, 294. Any other 35s in the room? Give everybody a round of applause.
I meant what I said. I am proud to be part of the Heartland Alliance family. It has been an honor to be here tonight. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy uh, the rest of your meal and your drinks. I promise you I won't match that energy. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Dan Kirshner, Bob Kirshner's son. My, yeah. My dad wore a lot of hats as a forensic pathologist, but none so fitting and so large and so wide-brimmed as his work in human rights. Before I get into that, I want to recognize my mom, Barbara Kirshner, a world-renowned physician in her own right. <laughs> On behalf of myself and my fellow event co-chairs, we're grateful for the extraordinary commitment of everyone here in making the Marjorie Kovler Center a sustainable success for those who are most in need of its services. To Charlie Garrido and the generous foundations who kicked us off with a $30,000 matching gift to start, thank you for making this evening possible. As we close out this evening's Power of Healing event, I offer a quick reflection. We're all here because we feel connected to the human rights mission and to the imperative work of the Kovler Center. For my father, Bob Kirshner, it was important to him that his human rights work on the international stage necessarily included a focus on human rights work right here in Chicago. His credibility and his integrity required as much. In documenting torture and extrajudicial executions and mass graves, he brought the same vigor and intellectual honesty to bringing justice to victims throughout the Americas, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, as he did right here at home for victims of police torture under Chicago Police Commander Burge, and for so many of the displaced asylum-seeking refugees served by the Kovler Center. For him as a child of McCarthyism, seeing so many of his parents, friends, and colleagues displaced, how do you speak against a foreign government if you will not do so with the same vigor and vitriol when our own government missteps? In investigating religious and ethnic persecution in Rwanda and Yugoslavia, how do, you do as a Jew, how do you do that as a Jew? If not, you do the same for Palestinians in Israel and the occupied territories. <laughs> Being here tonight, you have all honored my dad's legacy by supporting the important and necessary international human rights work of the Kovler Center on a local level right here in Chicago. This mission did not start tonight and does not end tonight. I ask you to please join me and continuing to stay engaged through service, volunteerism, generous giving, and sharing the work of the Kovler Center with your friends, families, and colleagues. We look forward to seeing you at the next volunteer opportunity or special event. Until next year's Power of Healing celebration, thank you, have a wonderful evening, and please be safe. <laughs>